Hi, everybody, and welcome to our next installment, our sixth of the Radical Philosophy Hour. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, we're here today with some fine speakers, and I just want to announce before we move on that we have a couple coming up as well from a couple of great talks in October, October 4th at 3 p.m. That's a change in time. I'll come back to that in just one second. Uh, but our, our next one's going to be really exciting, uh, interesting talk to uh, two folks who study uh, fascism and anti-fascism, Joan Brown from uh, Gonzaga University. She'll be talking about why we should stop calling Nazis, quote unquote, extremists, limitations of counter extremism discourse for work against fascism and the great disequilibrium. So that's Joan's talk coming up again, October 4th. And then Devin uh, Shaw will also be presenting from Douglas College. And he'll be talking about seven theses on the three-way fight uh, for a discussion. So. There'll be a, a really nice, I think, coherence between these two on questions of uh, fascism and anti-fascism, like I said. So that's coming up October 4th. That's Monday, as always, um, at 3 p.m. that time. So it's an hour sooner than, than our normal time. All right, so turning to today, I think we have a couple of really great and interesting uh, conversations uh, today. Um, firstly, we'll be hearing from Sergio Armando Gallegos Or Orica. Uh, who's assistant professor of philosophy at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, he received his PhD from the Graduate Center of the C uh, City of New York um, University in 2011. His main ongoing research project focuses on exploring the various connections between uh, Latin American philosophy and American philosophy, particularly pragmatism, with the goal of putting both traditions in conversation so that they can enri enrich one another. Uh, he's the author of a uh, whole lot of articles at the intersection of Latin American philosophy and US pragmatism. Uh, in particular, he's published uh, Andres Bello as a prefiguration of Richard Rorty in Transactions of the Charles Pierce Society, and a second article um, similarly on Andres Bello uh, entitled uh, I Representations as Mental Currency, reading Hugh Price through Andres Bello. Uh, so that's uh, forthcoming in the transactions as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. There's a lot more on here, very excellent things <laughs> to consider, uh, but go ahead and lead us off with the discussion and then we'll come back later to hear from Joseph Trellinger. Thank you, Brandon. So um, let, uh, let us get started. Let me share uh, my screen so we can uh, go ahead with uh, the presentation. All right, so the title of my talk is The Insurrectionist Ethics of uh, Ricardo Flores Magón in Tierra y Libertad. Uh, so let me uh, give you a bit of uh, an outline of my presentation. So I'll talk initially about uh, some motivation for the paper, the thesis that I will be defending uh, in it and the strategy. I will then provide some brief historical background on Ricardo Flores Magón. I will move on to uh, rehearse briefly the circumstances of composition of Tierra y Libertad, uh, which was uh, written and performed uh, during the Mexican Revolution in 1917. I will offer a brief synopsis of uh, the play just to give you a flavor of it, though I uh, strongly invite you to read it uh, at some point. It's uh, a really powerful uh, read. Then I will talk about uh, the main features of an insurrectionist ethics relying on the work of Leonard Harris and uh, Lee McBride, essentially. Then I will uh, talk about Tierra y Libertad, so land and freedom as an example of an insurrectionist ethics. And then I will move on to offer some uh, consequences and a brief conclusion. All right, so the motivation for the paper is the following. Insurrectionist ethics, uh, which was initially articulated by uh, Professor Leonard Harris has been further developed by scholars such as Lee McBride in a series of articles by Jacoby Carter and by Christy Dodson. Uh, uh, these scholars have done an amazing work uh, developing Harris insight, but a shortcoming of the Eston literature and insurrectionist ethics is that uh, from my point of view, it focuses almost exclusively on United States uh, authors. So for instance, uh, Bernard Harris focuses on David Walker and Frederick Douglass, Jacoby Carter focuses on Maria Stewart, and Lee McBride focuses on uh, Thoreau and Angela Davis. And this focus on US figures might give the impression that insurrectionist ethics is circumscribed to the US context. So my motivation for the paper is to show that insurrectionist ethics as a theoretical lens is applicable 
uh, to understand how non-US figures, in particular Latin American uh, figures, have struggled against oppression. Indeed, given that Latin America endured slavery, colonialism, imperialism, numerous people in various Latin American countries have articulated ethical proposals aimed at diagnosing and resisting oppression that are similar to what we find in the US context. And the specific thesis that I'll be defending is that we can find in the writings of the Mexican philosopher Ricardo Flores Magón, particularly in his play Tierra y Libertad, a kind of insurrectionist ethics. So here's my strategy. I'll present a brief biography of Ricardo Flores Magón. I will rehearse succinctly the circumstances of composition of Tierra y Libertad. I will offer a brief synopsis of the play. I will present the main features that roughly characterize an insurrectionist ethics. I will argue that we find these features of insurrectionist ethics in Tierra y Libertad. And I will draw some consequences and offer a brief conclusion. All right, so let me say a few things about Ricardo Flores uh, Magón. He was born in 1873 uh, in the second half of the 19th century, and he passed away in 1922. Uh, and he was one of the most important Mexican writers, activists, and philosophers of the late 19th century and the early 20th century. He was born in an El Oxochitlan, uh, which is uh, a tiny uh, village in Oaxaca that was actually renamed in his honor within a liberal family. He studied law in Mexico City as a young student, but he did not graduate. And part of the reason that he did not graduate is that as a young student, he was deeply influenced by the writings of uh, particularly anarchist authors like Bakunin, Proudhon, and Kropotkin. And as a result, based of his uh, immersion in anarchist literature, he became immersed in politics, denouncing the corruption and the cronism of the regime of Porfirio Diaz, who was twice president of Mexico uh, uh, from 1877 to 1880 and 1884 to uh, uh, 1911. So a very long period of time in Mexican history. So, Along with uh, his brother Enrique, Flores Magón became a very prominent voice in the Mexican Liberal Party. And I will open a brief parenthesis here. The name is a bit of a misnomer. Though the uh, party was named uh, Liberal, in fact, there were anarchists or anarcho-socialists. Uh, so with that, I'll close my parentheses while also editing the uh, newspaper Regeneración. Now, in virtue of his uh, attacks on uh, Diaz's regime during the early 1900s, he was forced into exile in the US, where he spent several years collaborating with US members of the International Workers uh, of the World, the so-called Wobblies, and promoting revolutionary activities in Mexico. And after the beginning of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, his followers briefly occupied in 1911 uh, Baja California, but they were defeated by the forces of uh, the uh, then president of Mexico, Francisco I. Madero, uh, who wanted political change in Mexico, but without a social revolution. Uh, uh, so after the failure of the Magonistas to create an anarcho-socialist community in 1911, Flores Magón, who was still exiled in the US, continued his political activism to promote social revolution in Mexico and across uh, the world. And in particular, in 1917, he published a manifesto of the workers of the world in which he advocated uh, for them, which he urged them to no longer participate in the ongoing war efforts that were taking place uh, within the context of World War I. Now, because of this, uh, since he was in the US, he was arrested by the US government, charged with sedition under the Espionage Act of 1917 and condemned to a 20 year uh, prison sentence. And, uh, during his prison sentence, uh, which uh, he spent at the Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas, he died in 1922, and his remains were subsequently repatriated to Mexico and interred in 1945 in the Rotonda de Hombres Ilustres, which is one of the most uh, uh, famous cemeteries in Mexico where a lot of distinguished Mexicans uh, rest. So let me talk now a little bit about the circumstances of composition of Tierra y Libertad. Uh, so, Ricardo Flores Magón wrote a lot uh, in many different formats, so pamphlets, manifestos, and addresses. Uh, and in addition, he authored a very voluminous, voluminous correspondence and various literary works. So among these literary works, we can find in particular several short stories and two plays. Uh, Tierra y Libertad from 1916 and uh, 
Victimas y Verdugos uh, from 1918. Now, Flores Magón composed specifically plays since he believed that theater, which had a public uh, dimension, would be a good platform to perform, uh, sorry, to present and disseminate his uh, ideas in addition to writing in uh, newspapers, which is uh, what he did as a member of the editorial team of Regeneración. So Tierra y Libertad was written during and shortly after a short prison stint that Flores Magón endured in uh, 1916. Uh, indeed, while living in California, in Edendale, he was arrested along with his brother Enrique for depositing indecent material in the US mail. So that was the charge. Uh, so Ricardo and Enrique were in prison from uh, February to August in 1916, and they were released uh, after uh, a collection organized by Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman was able to uh, uh, be gathered so they could uh, basically afford bail. And Tierra y Libertad premiered on December the 30th in 1916 at the TMA Hall in Los Angeles. Uh, and its production was extremely simple. So this is a perfect example of guerrilla theater. It included no professional actors. The cast was composed of family members of the Flores Magones and close friends of uh, him, along as a few members of the Mexican Liberal Party. And the premiere drew a large crowd and was a success, even though there were credible threats that it would be bombed by uh, the FBI, because this was seen as uh, a seditious revolutionary activity that was organized by uh, uh, anarchists. Uh, however, despite of this, the premiere was uh, a, rel uh, a relative success in LA. So um, let me now offer a brief synopsis of the play. Uh, so, uh, oops. Uh, so the uh, play portrays a group of Mexican peasants and workers in the first decade of the 20th century as they struggle against the abuses that are inflicted on them. In particular, the play centers on the actions of three characters, a couple, uh, Juan and Marta, and their friend Marcos, who are all indentured farmhands in an hacienda, so that's an estate owned by uh, a landlord, Don Julian. And Don Julian is a despotic and lustful figure who uses his power and position to have Juan in prison since he wants to sleep with Marta. So uh, the landlord, Don Julian, is aided in his efforts by Don Benito, a corrupt priest who longs to become bishop and requires uh, Julian's support to realize his ambitions. And Don Benito preaches to the farmhands obedience to the landlord and resignation to their uh, status in life. So, while Don Julian has basically Juan thrown in jail, uh, Marcos attempts to convince the rest of the indentured farm workers to organize and stage a revolution to end the abuses they're subject to. And though he's initially unsuccessful, since the farmhands feel fear the revolt will be for naught, he eventually manages to convince him to stage an uprising. Marcos then leads the group of insurgent workers who have been loaned by uh, some local soldiers to the prison. He frees Juan and Marta, as just as uh, she's about to be raped by Don Julian. Uh, insofar as she had gone to prison to petition for once release. And uh, Marcos has Don Julian and Benito executed for their crimes. So in the last act of the play, the government in Mexico City, upon hearing news of the revolt, dispatches the federal army to crush it. And the very final scene portrays the last stand of the insurgent workers against the army, who gladly prefer to die rather than return to their prior uh, indentured condition. So let me now talk a little bit about the main features of an insurrectionist ethics. Since I contend that Tierra Libertad exemplifies a kind of insurrectionist ethics, it is important to keep in mind what an insurrectionist ethics consists in. And following uh, Leonard Harris and uh, Lee McBride, I think that there are four uh, key features that characterize an insurrectionist ethics. The first feature is a willingness to define norms and conventions when those norms sanction and perpetuate injustice and oppression. Uh, the second feature is uh, that insurrectional ethicists maintain conceptions of personhood and humanity, the moral action against obvious injustice and brutality, justifying militancy and radical action on behalf of persecuted people. A third feature is uh, the a reliance of, on representative heuristics, so communities and coalitions of, res of resistance for Lee McBride rely upon representative heuristics where individuals or subgroups within a population represent the whole population. And finally, the fourth feature of an insurrectionist ethics is that uh, insurrectionist ethicists give esteem to insurrectionist character traits such as audacity, ten uh, 
tenacity, enmity, indignation, and guile. When these traits are basically developed uh, as a way to basically resist uh, the, uh, the oppression um, by certain groups. So keeping in mind these four features of an insurrectionist ethics, we can use them as a lens to analyze Ricardo Flores Magón's uh, play, which, to which I turn now. So what now uh, here comes, and here is basically the big part uh, uh, of, I mean, the uh, most important claim of my paper, Tierra y Libertad uh, seems to exemplify the four aforementioned features that characterize an insurrectionist ethics. And I'm going to try to argue for this by presenting some textual evidence. So in regards to the willingness to define norms, which is the first trait of insurrectionist ethics, consider the following exchange in act two, which has only one scene. So this is an exchange between Marcos and one of the uh, peasants. So uh, the peasant tells him, my father died in prison, my brother in the military barracks, and Mar Marcos responds, and with all this experience, you still wait for justice from the government, open your eyes, what we poor need is for us to take justice with our own hands, we must rebel. So as we can clearly appreciate, Marcos illustrates here in this passage, a willingness to define norms by rebelling against the government since it does basically perpetuate injustice. So the play also offers a neat example of uh, characters endorsing a conception of humanity that motivates action, which is the second key feature of an insurrectionist ethics. Consider the following uh, dialogue between Don Benito, the, the corrupt priest, and Rosa, a follower in Marcos, also in act two. So Rosa uh, has the following with cunning to the priest. And those who are happy on the earth, can they also enter the kingdom of heaven? And Don, ben Don Benito replies unctuously, uh, naturally, my daughter, naturally, if they are good Christians. And Rosa replies, well, then it would be good if all of us will enjoy everything here on the earth and in the kingdom of heaven, at least this would be just, a truly just God would devote himself to making that we all would be happy like a good father uh, of a family devotes himself to the happiness of all of his children. So as we can clearly appreciate, Rosa endorses here a conception of person who derived from Christianity that motivates action on behalf of poor, of oppressed people so they can basically enjoy justice. And what is really ironic is that it's a peasant woman who's making this claim to a priest. So uh, yeah, this is just, uh, I mean, really powerful uh, for me. Let me now uh, move on to uh, the third main characteristic of an, ins um, an insurrectionist uh, ethics, which is the use of representative heuristics as a way to create coalitions of resistance. I think that this is very present in um, uh, the work of Ricardo Flores de Magón, as we can see in the following passage uh, where Marcos addresses the local soldiers who have come to arrest them in act two. So this is what Marcos tells them. Death has come to your oppressor. Would you now dare take uh, your brother? He pounds his fist against his chest. All of you are poor like us. And by supporting the government with your rifles, you support that which makes wretched ourselves and yourselves as well. Your families live in misery, suffer hunger, nakedness, and oppression. And you, with your rifles, sustain that which causes the suffering of your own people, of the flesh of your flesh, and of the the blood of your blood. So as we can see, Marcos uses the case of the soldiers and the families as representatives of the poor in order to uh, create a coalition of resistance of all the poor against the bourgeois oppressors. And I think that this is a very clear example of representative heuristics. Finally, the play also provides a great illustration of esteem being given to insurrectionist character traits, such as anger and indignation. To illustrate this, consider the following passage in Act Two, when Ramon, a peasant, informs Marcos and Rosa of Juan's imprisonment. So Ramon tells the following: Yes, the master, the master has ordered the arrest of Juan. The master tries to seduce Marta. Marta rejects the master's flattery. The master sees that the obstacle is Juan, for whom Marta feels profound love. And to get rid of Juan, the master has ordered his arrest, accusing him of robbing a steer. Juan has been taken to the city jail where they will make him enlist as a soldier. And Rosa says indignant, this is more than I can support. And Marcos being furious says, such an infamy demands a quick end. So the anger and indignation are given high esteem by uh, Flores Magón because according to him, this is precisely what sparks Marcos and Rosa, Marcos in particular, to start basically the uprising against uh, uh, Don Julian and Don Benito. So, 
just to wrap up some consequences and a brief conclusion. I've argued here that uh, Tierra y Libertad, uh, this wonderful play by Ricardo Flores Magón, can be viewed as illustrating an instance of an insurrectionist ethics in uh, a context outside the US, in Latin America, in Mexico specifically. If this is the case, I think that the theoretical lens that uh, Leonard Harris developed and has been taken by other scholars can be used to study figures in, and texts basically beyond the US, specifically in Latin America. And the expansion of the scope of Harris' lens to other figures and texts raises, I think, some interesting questions. So for instance, is it class-based representative heuristics like the one that uh, Flores Magón advocates uh, in Tierra Libertad more effective than, for instance, a race-based representative heuristics? Uh, I intend to address this and other questions in future work. Thank you. Let me just uh, end uh, screen sharing. Excellent. Thanks so mm -hmm. much. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So uh, what we're going to do now is go ahead and hear from our other presenter, Joseph Trellinger. Uh, once we do, we'll be able to combine what I think are two really excellent and provocative points of view and discussions, um, both of which I think are going to provide a lot of overlap. So just uh, really quickly then, let me uh, introduce um, Joseph, um, let's see if I can find my uh, uh, materials. Um, Joseph has been, my apologies, y'all. Joseph has been an assistant professor of honors in philosophy at George Washington University since 2014. Uh, he's published several articles on uh, the moral theology of Immanuel Kant, as well as the radical utopian politics of Herbert Marcuse. Uh, lately, his research centers on the intersection between utopian philosophy and liberation theology and how political theology can be rethought from the position of the marginalized. Uh, Joseph resides in Washington, D.C., um, and he says, for as long as it does not bear too close of a resemblance to Berlin in the late 1920s. Um, so with that said, I will go ahead and turn it over to Joseph, and I think, Joseph, you'll be reading your paper. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, can you all hear me? Great. Uh, the title of my talk today is John Brown as Episode or Eternal Truth, a Prophetic Intervention on Political Theology. There are all sorts of accounts of John Brown out there for those who care to read, many of them eager to denounce the abolitionist as a religious nut job. And if that is not already a pleonasm within the mind of a sensible liberal society, the sort of demented egomaniac who will not listen to rational argument. Just take this excerpt from US historian Paul Finkelman's 1995 book on Brown. Finkelman writes, before the Civil War, religion conveyed the language of the inner mind. Brown always immersed his deepest feelings in the waters of faith. Yet the nature of his religion differed from evangelical orthodoxy in its, un in its equal emphasis upon the old along with the New Testament, a religion of punishment, violence, and rigid adherence to petty rules, end quote. This rather cavalier Marcionite dismissal of Judaism hinges upon some entrenched anti-Semitic stereotypes of the Hebrew prophets and the God they represent as fundamentally angry, lacking in the cool, calm, and measured dispassion that supposedly characterizes Jesus. I contend, on the other hand, that this apparently preferable apathy is more indicative of commonsensical liberal indecision a sort of skeptical detachment through which privileged people can occasionally disavow the very same systematic oppression that makes possible their comfortable pseudo-neutrality masquerading as objectivity. The so-called Old Testament God appears in this widespread view as fundamentally punitive. And here many a prison abolitionist with their dog-eared copies of Nietzsche and Foucault might concur. But I wish to pause for a second and question the political theology informing the smooth equation of faith equaling anger, equaling violence, equaling irresponsibility to interhuman suffering. Such easy equivalencies, ready to hand as they are to retrench the front lines of our society and stalemate, trade on an implicit and fundamental equation of sovereignty with universality. That is, they begin with the pre-understanding that the status quo is prima facie legitimate, and only a fanatic or a lunatic, someone deeply disconnected from interhuman accountability by their misbegotten and uncritical faith in voices they and they alone hear, could feel such opposite conviction that they oppose this established order. 
Alberto Toscano's excellent study on fanaticism as a fundamentally political term sharpens this point. Fanatic is a term of abuse by which one can depict one's opponents as willingly but unwittingly outside a communal orbit of moral suasion. Take, for example, the following interchange John Brown had with an unnamed bystander in the company of Ohio Congressman Mr. Vallandigham immediately after his capture when his attempted raid of Harper's Ferry failed on October 19, 1859. The bystander, to set them, meaning every black person in the US, free would sacrifice the life of every man in this community. Brown, I do not think so. The bystander, I know it. I think you are fanatical. Brown, and I think you are fanatical. Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad, and you are mad." End quote. Far more than a sophomoric ad hominem to quoque, Brown's retort that the pro-slavery bystander is fanatical should give us pause. The customary dismissal of Brown as crazy is the product of a sadly successful post-reconstruction backlash against abolitionism. If sympathizers with the so-called lost cause of the Confederacy can persuade the broader public that Brown is a nutcase, then no matter how much they sympathize with the cause of civil rights, Brown is discredited and along with him, so is his willingness to use direct action and even violence in defense of human freedom. Like the statues of Confederate generals stonily terrorizing our public spaces, this characterization of Brown reinforces the impression that white supremacism is unquestionably sovereign, so normalized that it appears as commonsensical. This flattening out of the rational to the commonsensical is what Herbert Marcuse calls one dimensionality. And Brown's propheticism is in its own way, which I hope here to explore, part of the great refusal of such one dimensionality. Following Cornell West, I contend that a rapprochement of Marxist and Christian conviction is possible because as West puts it in his prophesied deliverance, quote, their prophetic and progressive wings share one fundamental similarity commitment to the negation of what is and the transformation of prevailing realities in the light of the norms of individuality and democracy, end quote. The prophet's angry denunciation negates the one-dimensional equation of the world as it is with the world as it ought to be. And thus, while it may lack a materialist analysis, propheticism along with Marxism nonetheless speaks against the normalization and naturalization of exploitative and dehumanizing social conditions. It's commonplace to characterize, as Finkelman does, the Old Testament God as angry, but in so doing cover over what it is God's angry about. And God is angry about oppression, about the insensitivity of the powerful to the unnecessary suffering they exact upon the biblical triad of the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. That is, those that even the so-called New Testament God of Jesus calls the least of these. In other words, the prophet is not actually not disconnected from the interhuman situation, but quite the opposite. The prophet is on the side of the poor and the oppressed, against the wealthy and the powerful. Their denunciations and all their poetic strangeness are hurled like lightning bolts against the reification of injustice, so as to blast open neglected social alternatives, to jolt the powerful and all those who benefit from normalized violence against the poor out of their complacency. There is a certain romanticism to imagining the prophet as a lone figure, misunderstood by the society around them, Somebody once said a prophet is never accepted in their hometown. I've heard that somewhere, who can remember? Uh, and goodness knows I am the last person you will ever meet who will dislike romanticism. But I wish to refine this picture of the prophet's loneliness a little by re-politicizing it. The prophet is misunderstood by the status quo, but not by the downtrodden. Notice that the bystander who accuses Brown of trying to destroy the community is implicitly excluding the enslaved black population from that community. And this tacit exclusion has been so normalized that it's become definitive of rationality itself. Thus Brown counts as outside the bounds of sense by transgressing it, a fanatic. So Brown's retort that the pro-slaver is fanatical is quite a nice rhetorical pushback against this normalization of whiteness with humanity and therefore rationality. We should pay closer attention to the prophet as a communal figure, for however misunderstood they are by the political majority, 
they may nonetheless represent the suppressed rationality of the oppressed, giving this countersense a poetically forceful backing. John Brown's idea for fomenting a slave revolt did not come out of just the confines of his own head, like some anti-Athena springing from Zeus's skull. He took guidance from black people. He took inspiration from precursors in remote and proximate history. By the slave revolt aboard the Amistad, by Toussaint Louverture in Haiti, and by David Walker. Now this last name may not be familiar to you all. David Walker was a black man who in 1829 wrote an infamous appeal to the colored citizens of the world, arguing that it is not only the right but the God-given duty of enslaved people to rebel and overthrow their masters with violence. According to Walker, quote, this country is as much ours as it is the whites. Whether they will admit it now or not, they will see and believe it by and by, end quote. It is this pre-understanding of whiteness as definitive for humanity that is beneficial and indeed necessary to a sovereign-centered perspective. If we still think of Brown as a lone lunatic answering to nobody, I charge that that may say more about just how normalized it is to treat black people as non-persons than it does about Brown's sanity. We are not helped out in this regard by our training as philosophers. We are almost entirely a theologically illiterate bunch. We read Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling, and it confirms our priors. It cements our impression, admittedly shaped in too many instances by how our experience of religion has been traumatizing, that religion is an inherently irresponsible and inhumane phenomenon, dangerously unanswerable to interhuman accountability. But if you are familiar with Black liberation theology, or theology as done by any number of people at the margins, such as queer theology, you will have a more complicated view, and I would charge, one that does greater justice to the under-theorized fact, at least in our discipline, philosophy, that religion remains important to many of the people that we would help liberate, we knowing ones, to use that phrase from every leftist favorite incel, Nietzsche. On the rare occasions when we do note this possibility, as Leonard Harris does in his appraisal of, John, of Brown as a hero by the criterion of his insurrectionist ethics, which we just lovingly and uh, clearly heard about, uh, there is still so robust and frankly so ignorant an anti-clericalism that we foreclose the possibility of a more nuanced understanding of propheticism. The only political theology with which philosophers appear to be acquainted is what I call sovereign-centered political theology. Sovereign-centered political theology is the discipline of viewing the parallels between politics and religion as meeting together in the idea of sovereignty, with a monarch serving as the governmental equivalent of God on earth, capable of creating order out of chaos without precedent or oversight, with supreme will and determination. There is a whole sub-discipline of philosophy mulling over the various puzzles that arise from this parallel as articulated by its most famous progenitor, Carl Schmitt. To date, there has been only one serious political theological analysis of the abolitionist John Brown's failed raid on Harper's Ferry, a relatively recent book by Ted A. Smith, this one, uh, Weird John Brown, who uses the conceptual tools provided by Carl Schmitt, along with Giorgio Agamben and Walter Benjamin, to understand Brown's mission as a suspension of law and sovereignty. I argue such sovereign-centered theology misses the centrality of God's poor, as Brown puts it, in his own thinking, and is therefore bound to distort an abolitionist theology into one that sides with the slaveholders. The central puzzle Brown leaves us with is not whether and by what right we can suspend normal law without replicating authoritarianism, but instead whether and for whom we will engage in what West calls the negation of what is, so central to solidarity with the oppressed. Accounts such as Smith's overlook how Brown places God's poor front and center in his mission, such as in his defense speech at his trial, and here I quote from Brown, had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or in behalf of any of their friends, either father, mother, brother, sister, wife, or children, or any of that class, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, it would have been all right. And every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done and as I have always freely admitted I have done, in behalf of his despised poor was not wrong, but right." End quote. 
We can see echoes of this in Du Bois's positive appraisal of John Brown. Du Bois's biography of John Brown is one of his more overlooked pieces and certainly compelling for the subtext of what it means for Du Bois in 1905 to stress Brown's coalitional self-positioning amid international freedom struggles. Although this passage is somewhat lengthy, I quote it here in full because it encompasses almost every dimension of what I wish to drive at today. Was John Brown simply an episode or was he an eternal truth? And if a truth, how speaks that truth today? John Brown loved his neighbor as himself. He could not endure therefore to see his neighbor poor, unfortunate or oppressed. This natural sympathy was strengthened by a saturation in Hebrew religion which stressed the personal responsibility of every human soul to a just God. To this religion of equality and sympathy with misfortune was added the strong influence of the social doctrines of the French Revolution with, with its emphasis on freedom and power in political life. And on all this was built John Brown's own inchoate but growing belief in a more just and equal distribution of property. From this he concluded and acted on that conclusion that all men are created free and equal and that the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. Now I have to follow up Du Bois with my own words. It's gonna sound terrible uh, next, to, next to that eloquence. Uh, my basic contention, which I will have to wait for another opportunity to further flesh out, is that Brown's rather simple but powerful premise for his militancy is a shining example of what Elaine Badiou considers to be a truth event the eternal truth of human equality, as both Du Bois and Badiou would agree. According to Badiou, an event is an encounter with a truth that radically reconfigures the subject in such a way that ordinary and quotidian experience cannot, catalyzing both this individual and others who undergo this event into the same revolutionary militancy. Badiou writes, every truth procedure breaks with the axiomatic principle that governs the situation and organizes its repetitive series. A truth procedure interrupts repetition and can therefore not be supported by the abstract permanence proper to a unity of the count. In other words, the eventual nature of truth comes into the ordinary course of things with a vertical slice, transpiercing, as Badiou says, the normalization of inequality with an infinite idea. Yet I would add to that verticality of the truth event that can break with the one, dimensional, one dimensionality of all reification we should also acknowledge the horizontality of interhuman accountability, lest we give carte blanche to anybody claiming to act under heavenly inspiration without any responsibility to other human beings. Rather than see this verticality and this horizontality as irreconcilable, I see them going together in propheticism sympathizing sympathy for God's despised poor. The poetic the prophet, excuse me, the, po the prophet poetically intensifies the verticality of the infinite idea of equality, but not as a lone agent outside of any human community, but in response to and in compassion for that community suffering dehumanization at the hands of the respectable order. From the standpoint of the established order, the prophetic word is a rupture, a bolt from the blue yet one intended to resensitize us to a truly universal human community by negating and denouncing the false universality of the status quo. The prophet shocks, not because he doesn't answer to human rationality, but because he reveals the irrational character of society's rationality, as Marcuse puts it. In this way, we should attend closely to Brown's continual invocation of human fraternity as the guiding principle of his mission or as Badiou puts it, through the event, we enter into filial equality. In this way, a prophetic figure such as Brown functions as what Jose Medina has called an epistemic hero, whose radical acts of social disruption have an echoable or repeatable significance for the sake of social change. That is, it is not just an episode from the lone mind of a crackpot, but as Du Bois might say, an eternal truth with meaning today. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, overlap here. I'm still waiting for folks on Facebook. Hopefully they'll, they'll decide to chime in one way or another uh, as we go forward. 
Um, I guess a first thought that occurred to me, uh, particularly as we were hearing from you, Sergio, but I think it applies in the case of Joseph as well, is do you see, and if the answer is no, or I need to think about it, that's fine. But how do you see these figures as and ideas as relating to, um, so you've got insurrectionary uh, or an insurrectionist ethics, but what about the, the, the sort of political view of insurrectionary anarchism? So, um, I mean, in the case of, of Magon, it seems that there is pretty, a pretty natural connection. And I wonder mm -hmm. um, sort of if there's a historical connection, but then also from a sort of um, philosophical point of view, how you draw these ideas into a, a unit or if you do. Well, I mean, there has been uh, quite a bit of uh, work done on the uh, actually politics of uh, Ricardo Flores uh, Magon, essentially by uh, Mexican scholars. Uh, but there hadn't, uh, I mean, in uh, uh, my scholarly revisions of the literature, I had not seen a lot of people focusing on the uh, ethical underpinnings, basically, of uh, his political ideas. And this is something that I do want to basically uh, contribute to with uh, my paper by showing that uh, the political ideas and uh, the political activities of Ricardo Flores Magón are uh, grounded on, uh, as I try to uh, show, an insurrectionist ethics that is um, uh, articulated by some very deep ethical commitments uh, towards basically the uh, oppression, sorry, the liberation basically of uh, oppressed uh, groups. And this is, I think, something that uh, really motivates uh, uh, his, uh, both his politics and also his, uh, uh, his activism. This uh, uh, really uh, ethical framework that ultimately uh, uh, supports and justifies basically the need to engage in uh, insurrection in order to ultimately uh, uh, respond to the deep injustices that uh, many, uh, actually the vast majority of groups in Mexican society uh, at the eve of the revolution and even within, uh, uh, still within the revolution, were basically uh, facing. So thank you for your question, Brian. Sure. Mm -hmm. Joseph, did you want to respond to that at all? Or did you have any, I, I have have more in the back pocket, so. Uh, that's, that's such a good question. I'm afraid I'm not prepared to answer it and would need to think more about it. I mean, I can take, um, I can take a bit of a stab at potential answers. Uh, Brown himself uh, had some ideas uh, about the formation of a new uh, US society um, this is, of course, predicated on the idea that his um, the slave revolt that he hoped to foment would have succeeded. Um, it's not it's not thoroughly worked out. He does draw quite a lot from the Declaration of Independence, this idea that all, uh, as it says, all men are created equal. And of course, there is very much the the hypocritical violation of this uh, fundamental idea in the founding of uh, the U.S. government. And in that respect, um, Brown is trying to continue uh, the United States in a, in a sort of patriotic vein, if you will, um, rather than dismantle the idea of government altogether or uh, the creation of something entirely horizontal. Uh, in that respect, I don't think we can look to Brown as uh, an anarchist. Uh, he does, he did write a provisional constitution and ordinances for the people of the United States. And it's, when you read it, uh, quite minimal. It only has seven articles. Um, and he seems not to have been terribly interested in working that out. He saw himself far more as an instrument of God, uh, basically as the arm to, to help uh, empower and arm black people to fight for their own freedom. Uh, in this regard, as, um, as Sergio was uh, hinting at in, in one of uh, Leonard Harris's writings, Harris uh, sees Brown as an example, Brown and his inspiration from Walker as an example of insurrectionist ethics. Um, I'm afraid I don't have more than that to give you as an answer. Sorry for if I 
talked around it or didn't answer no, it. No, not at all. Though it, it does take us, I guess, into my sort of next question, which is a relationship, especially since you said that the sort of political end is not particularly well worked out or didn't seem to occupy uh, Brown to a significant mm -hmm. extent. I wonder to what extent, and I, we can start with you, Joseph, and then maybe come back to Sergio. Um, to what extent do you think that we, we can sort of operate with the division between, say, uh, faith and action or faith and praxis, and then side put Brown on the side of you know faith as praxis or action? And a similar question then we could frame to Sergio in terms of theory, if we like. So theory versus praxis or theory versus action. And you know, it seems like both of the figures that you're talking about are figures who see themselves as very much on the side of praxis or very much on the side of action. Um, and so I, I wonder how you view that sort of opposition and how it plays into this question of, you know, the both the political theology as well as the sort of idea of an insurrectionist ethics. So Joseph, if you want to take that one and then we can yeah, the, the opposition between theory and action being the theory opposition between theory and action, or what? What? Yeah, yeah. So, that? so traditionally we would have in in you know, which theory and praxis dichotomy. Although in this case, one might say more so like a faith versus action or faith versus praxis dichotomy. Although that uh -huh. that presupposes that there's a good distinction to be made between theory and faith, which you know even that would require some unpacking. But yeah. Um, I, 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 I leave that to you. Go ahead. Yeah, if I can. I mean, one thing I'd like to point out that um, is, I think, very much unknown or relatively unknown, at least by my, many of the people I interact with, is that praxis is originally a theological term. I think a lot of people don't actually know that. Um, so praxis um, is this, this question of what it means to have faith without putting it into works. Uh, is squarely a theological uh, question. Now, um, that emphasis, so familiar to us through Martin Luther, Luther understood it in a very explicitly uh, depoliticizing way that affirmed the status quo. And that's what's um, part and parcel of what uh, scholars call magisterial Protestantism. The radical Protestants, such as Thomas Mützer, very much take this to its political uh, conclusion that to have faith means to take action. Brown himself said, caution is the word of cowardice. Uh, so Brown himself um, seems to constantly appeal to the Bible as his kind of theoretical font or his, the font of, of his faith. Um, I do wanna quote one letter of his if I can. Uh, because I think it is going to touch on something really important. Um, and of course, uh, since I flipped to one other part of the reading, uh, it's going to take me a second here. Okay, so this is the last letter that Brown wrote from jail to his wife and his daughters. And it's quite fascinating um, in what it says. He says, I do not ask any of you to throw away your reason. I only ask you to make a candid and sober use of your reason. My dear younger children, will you listen to this last poor admonition of one who can only love you? Uh, oh, be determined at once to give your whole hearts to God and let nothing shake or alter that resolution. You have no fear of regretting it. Do not be vain and thoughtless, but sober-minded. And I'm going to skip down a little bit um, where he says, uh, I must yet insert a reason for my firm belief in the divine inspiration of the Bible. Notwithstanding, I am perhaps naturally skeptical. Now, a lot of people don't know that about Brown because they don't bother to read Brown. Uh, certainly not credulous. I, uh, I'm perhaps naturally skeptical, certainly not credulous. I wish you all to consider it most thoroughly when you read that blessed book and see whether you cannot discover such evidence yourselves. It is that purity of heart, feeling, or motive, as well as word and action, which is everywhere insisted on that distinguish it from all other teachings, that commends it to my conscience, whether my heart be willing and obedient or not. The inducements that it holds out are another reason of my conviction of its truth and genuineness that I cannot here omit. And this, my last argument for the Bible eternal life is that my soul is panting after this moment. So in other words, for Brown, 
it is the it is the incitement to action that is the truth of the Bible. So not whether somebody in some place really did auditorily hear some kind of message and whether that was accurately transcribed and, and um, passed on without fault through the ages. The truth therefore is kind of accessible through some kind of, to put it in Kantian terms, moral theology. The theology is true because it speaks to an innate human moral truth. And this has to be exercised. Uh, so the relationship between faith and action is, is very intimate there. Does that address your question? Yeah, for sure. I think that's really nice. Uh, Sergio, would you, would you like to sort of weigh in on this side with uh, Magon as well? Yes. So uh, I think that in the case of uh, Flores Magon's work, there is, very, uh, there is a very clear uh, uh, ethical theological dimension to his uh, view in the sense that as, I, uh, as a uh, citation from uh, uh, the exchange between uh, Marta and uh, uh, the priest Don Benito basically exemplifies, uh, uh, Flores Magón is uh, deeply uh, committed to basically uh, uh, conception of basically Christianity as uh, a social um, uh, as a social um, uh, network that ultimately enables uh, people, particularly those who are most oppressed, to ultimately uh, demand. Um, their rights as uh, basically children of God uh, in order to basically live uh, 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 lives that are uh, minimally decent, that enable them uh, the necessary uh, elements to ultimately be able to uh, not just survive, but also thrive, which is something that uh, unfortunately is missing in the um, social uh, uh, structures that uh, basically are uh, present and that uh, dominate and oppress basically uh, Mexican peasants at the eve of the revolution. And uh, in light of this, Flores Magón uh, Flores Magón basically connects uh, his work and uh, his anar uh, his anarcho-socialist view with uh, basically Christianity uh, by saying that these are ultimately not different. I mean. Ultimately, they are advocating in their in different ways for the same uh, goals of social justice. Interesting. That's very cool. I, I you know, I think um, one of the questions I might want to raise, and I, I see we have one on Facebook, so I want to come back to that. But I thought I had two, and I, I wonder what you think about this. Is in both cases, is there a sense of, um, you know, so we see with Brown, but also with Magon, a kind of willingness to take action with the consequences be damned. Um, and so I, I, you know, I wonder about that and also then how that might connect into this question of insurrectionism as well as, um, you know, the relationship between either figure and Marxism, where at least it seems to me, you know, M Marx and Engels in the, in the Communist Manifesto with the critique of the, the utopians is saying that, you know, we need um, to think more very clearly about how we get from point A to point B, right? Like, who will be the who will be the revolutionary agent? Who has the power in society? Who who has access to levers in society? So it's a, a kind of strategic thinking, which to some extent maybe, and you all can tell me this is wrong if you think, but may, maybe wasn't so much on the minds of um, Brown and Magone, where they were a, a little more willing to take action, even if it wasn't the case that they, they expected to win. So, yeah. Do you, do you mind if I go first and, and I'll keep it brief? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Uh, Brown was very inspired by the example of Toissaint Louverture um, and the, the Haitian Revolution. So if you look at the Haitian Revolution, there was, uh, it's an outstanding human achievement um, a slave rebellion that results in a functioning constitutional government. This is very thrilling and, and shows in practice that you don't really need to sit down and have an elaborate plan in order to repel a, a very stunning uh, number of obstacles um, put in the way, 
put in their way by um, various colonial empires, uh, it will cost you, it will be bloody, uh, there will be violence, and it will be hard, but it can be done. And so I think to Brown's mind, he wanted to do what Louverture uh, helped to organize and you know, arm, the, arm the slaves, inspire, inspire them um, through his example, but also the example of other uh, slave revolts that had happened and he hoped to make happen. Basically to, um, yeah, tip the balance of power and then um, figure out what can be, what is to be done. Sure, Sergio. Yeah, so in the case of uh, Magon, he was, uh, I mean, he was very much aware that uh, the uh, uh, attempt to ultimately uh, undertake a revolution was fraught with uh, dangers and that it might well basically end up in uh, failure. Uh, however, uh, despite this, uh, one of his uh, reference in his uh, writings, particularly in uh, his journalistic writings, is uh, the Paris Commune. And uh, when uh, basically discussing uh, this um, uh, case, what Flores Magon basically uh, holds is that though the uh, Paris Commune uh, ultimately uh, uh, failed, ultimately, though it was ultimately crushed, uh, it was nevertheless ultimately useful as an example of what could be achieved by social organization of uh, the oppressed. Um, and uh, I think that he realized himself that even though he's uh, uh, a party, the Mexican Liberal Party would not perhaps ultimately be successful in uh, achieving a social revolution uh, in Mexico, though uh, he hoped, at least basically this would be uh, an example for future generations to uh, follow, uh, to ultimately learn how to uh, uh, organize, how to connect uh, with each other in ways that would ultimately uh, allow in uh, perhaps not at that particular historical moment, but uh, further down in the future, a true social revolution that would ultimately bring uh, social justice for uh, all, particularly for the most oppressed uh, ones. That's really interesting. So it sounds to me like inspiration and example is a really important aspect, both in terms of taking inspiration and following examples, but also recreating those and, and sort of projecting them into the future as these moments that might be taken up. Um, I have a, a question here on Facebook from uh, Reese, and it's directed to you, Joseph. It says, could you say more about why a focus on sovereignty in uh, Brown's political theology would miss the point? So he says, I can see why it would miss the masses in his thought or the poor, but uh, following Rancière, couldn't we locate the more legitimate claim to political authority and liberation in the dispossessed? So I suppose, it, is there a sovereignty of the people perhaps, as I think maybe the question that's being posed? Yeah. I think I think the issue there is you you wind up back in the quagmire of some of the things that uh, that Carl Schmidt is pointing out uh, about sovereignty. So one of the issues then with authority when it is multiple uh, is that that just inherently uh, to Schmidt's mind postpones the question of who decides. And according to Schmidt, this is the political question is who decides. Uh, so you wind up, you wind up um, mired in problems of um, discussion, consensus building. Uh, if you're a Ranciere follower, this is uh, unavoidable and you want to emphasize that this is a perpetual ongoing task. Uh, I think nonetheless, there is this ultimate issue of um, of authority as basically fungible. Uh, Ranciere talks about the count, you know, the, this issue of who gets to count, who counts. Um, and there's always some remainder, somebody who's left over. I think a far better emphasis with a different political theology comes out of liberation theology with this notion of the poor. Now, granted, 
poverty needs to be understood in some very rich and complex ways. And maybe this is uh, parallel to Ranciere, but um, there are those who are poor or who are unjustly made to suffer, who the original de generation of liberation theologians may not have considered. So poverty, not just in the sense of class exploitation, but um, sex exploitation or uh, sex discrimination, um, uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. This, this concept of poverty has been uh, developed and enriched over the last decades um, since uh, the most famous uh, liberation theologians uh, coming out of La Latin America have first put it forth um, in the 60s, um, uh, well, 50s and 60s. But the, I think there's this emphasis on sympathy and compassion, which is far more fruitful than this emphasis upon authority. I think there's something about the emphasis on authority that literally deifies apathy. Um, so this is something that I'm getting from Abraham Joshua Heschel, a Jewish uh, writer and theologian in his book, The Prophets, which was very inspirational for Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and very much so for Cornell West, who I also mentioned in my talk. Um, the basic idea is that the prophet is someone of immense sympathy, the person who basically takes on the pathos that God has for the poor who suffer. And that's the anger, that's the prophetic anger. Um, and I could say a lot more about that, but the very last thing I'll say just to quickly round it out is that philosophy, and here I think Schmidt falls into this, um, very much emphasizes apathy coming out of a tradition of stoicism where God has no feelings and the philosopher in imitation of God is also supposed to not have feelings and that cuts off the interhuman. That's my answer, thank you very much. Um, all right, so th thank you for that answer. I hope uh, Reese got to hear it. Um, so we're, we're at five. I think we should take, I, I hope it's okay with you all if we take a few more minutes. I have at least one more question here on Facebook that I think we can get to if, if you have a couple more minutes. Um, and this one says, uh, how does an individual or a group reconcile the cost of liberty versus exploitation? And I take it that what they're asking, and it goes back to this question about strategy and consequences be damned. So that's the way I'm, I'm hearing what they're asking. So the question would be something like, you know, especially and maybe even from the perspective of an insurrectionist ethics, like, you know, is there a weighing of consequences for action around and how do we weigh those around this question of liberation and emancipation? versus the continuation of exploitation. So jo Joseph, for example, you said the, the path ahead will be filled with obstacles. You probably won't win. It's gonna be bloody, right? So how does the, the insurrectionist ethic take on those the, the burden of those consequences and weigh them out? Um, and I'll go ahead and turn this over to you, Sergio, if you want first to think about it or talk about it with respect to Magon. Yes, I mean, I'll take a stab uh, at it. So, um... I mean, as I uh, did mention in my presentation, at uh, a certain moment in the play, uh, when Marcos is trying to uh, get uh, the indentured farm workers to basically unite and uh, revolt, they're initially very hesitant because uh, they've seen uh, or they've heard that uh, prior uh, uh, insurrections, prior revolts have ultimately uh, failed. And uh, Marcos basically, convinces them to uh, ultimately organize and revolt because uh, he says that uh, things will ultimately, um, um, things will ultimately, um, uh, I mean, we do have the power to ultimately change uh, things. And uh, so in, in virtue of this, he makes an emotional pitch to the uh, indenture farm workers. And as a result, basically, of this, uh, they revolt. Now, even when they're basically failing, uh, even when they're about to be killed by the army, uh, at least they ultimately, uh, and this is something that comes out very clearly at the end of the play, they uh, refuse to ultimately surrender because uh, uh, even though they're about to die, the feeling of freedom, the feeling of uh, ultimately being uh, even for a bit, uh, masters of uh, their own uh, lives uh, is basically so uh, transforming that uh, people say, well, 
ultimately, if I have to basically uh, give up my life uh, here, so be it. Because uh, the uh, the taste of freedom, the uh, a chance of basically setting up an example for others, is ultimately worth it. Um, and with the, actually with this, I'm going to have to conclude because I got a call that uh, I need to take. Uh, so sorry about that. Brandon. And, <laughs> well, thank you, mm -hmm. Sergio, for, for everything. Mm -hmm. We much appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Joseph, do you want to take a stab at that one and then we can uh, maybe let it go after? after? Yeah, um, this is certainly, in certain senses, um, quite a deep and, and, and uh, quite a deep problem. Um, I myself have to confess I don't fully uh, know how to answer it. Uh, Sergio's answer was quite beautiful. Uh, reminds me um, reminds me of Toussaint Louverture's uh, response to Napoleon when Napoleon was basically um, trying to say that he could offer uh, a, a, a safe resolution, but if only um, he were to hang up a banner that said, remember brave blacks that it is France who recognizes you. Um, in other words, making Louverture's response was, it is not a conditional freedom that we want. Uh, and his argument is, look, we have had to face death so many times. And the price of that itself, um, of living a truly free life, uh, there's such familiarity with um, the struggle that it takes to assert that, that um, this is this is paramount. Uh, now, as for questions of strategy and uh, what's to be involved there, Brown's disagreement with Frederick Douglass is really instructive. And uh, I might direct us and myself to go back and, and reread Leonard Harris uh, in his article, basically juxtaposing both, both um, Douglass and Brown on the one hand. And um, yeah, it just seems relevant to this question in a way that I'm not very well articulating. Yeah, so, um, well, thank you, Joseph. And, and again, thanks to Sergio who had to, had to run, hope everything's okay with, with him. Um, you've both uh, reminded me, and I'll, I, maybe I'll let this be our, our last word since I, I get to, I, as host, I get to steal the last word. Uh, you both reminded me of a favorite uh, song of mine by The Coup. Uh, it's a group called The Coup who their, their song is Underdogs. And uh, one of the lines that's sort of always stuck with me is they they tear this mfr up if they really loved you they say they say <laughs> the 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 word fully um but so I, th I think about this question of compassion sympathy love but also uh, the demand for action um all right well excellent thank you so much for your time um and everybody thanks for tuning in on facebook we'll see you again in october thank you <laughs>